Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Walt Miner, and I'm the community manager and for Automotive Grade Linux. And this is our Birds of a Feather session for software defined vehicles. And of course, uh, the first question you're all going to ask this is going to be mostly an interactive session. I only have three slides, okay? Um, first question you're going to ask that I always ask is, what is a software-defined vehicle? And um, so I actually spoke at a software-defined vehicle conference about six weeks ago. And I've attended a lot of uh, meetings where we have a software-defined vehicle expert group. And I still don't know what a software-defined vehicle is. I'm trying to figure it out. So I wrote down various definitions and ideas that I've heard. Um, we're going to delight the customer with new post-delivery features. Does that sound great? Um, we're going to have faster, safer, more secure updates throughout the life cycle of the vehicle. I think that starts pre-production through, you know, five years out, ten years out. I bought the car ten years ago, and you're still providing software updates to me. Um, it's a high compute platform. I need a high compute platform. I need a lot of horsepower. And I need to build extra hardware because car companies always like spending money. They're going to build an extra fast computer with, with, more, with extra memory in it that they're not going to use on delivery. And that high compute platform with tons of memory and tons of data storage because you're going to be delivering new features and you can't even imagine what those features are. You're going to have the metaverse in your car. It's all going to be hardware agnostic, and it can be moved throughout the vehicle. That sounds super cool. And then there's a vehicle data collector controller that collects data, lots and lots of data. I think, I think in Megan's talk today, she talked about 25 gigabits per, or 2.5 gigabits gigabytes per car per day. 25 gigabytes per car per day times 400 million vehicles and you're going to be sending data to the cloud and you're going to control the vehicle from the cloud. My friends at AVL were going to be downloading a in real time a, uh, an application to control my speed because there's a crash ahead. These are all really cool things but I still don't know what an SDV is. Okay, so then I stole a slide. This is stolen, and I'm even going to give credit to who I stole it from. I stole it from Woven, our friends at Toyota. What's an SDV? So an SDV has autonomous driving mode, cybersecurity, cloud integration, V to X connectivity, and a user experience. So that's a lot of stuff to focus on. Our SDV expert group at AGL has been focusing really on, on the enablers for all of this. Um, <clears throat> really focusing on, I think, Vert.io Vert as the vehicle abstraction, or I'm sorry, the hardware abstraction, so that you can move those, that functionality around within the vehicle. Um, you can have that high compute platform. You can have that uh, zonal controller that people talk about. Um, so. Um, I'm going to just close with this one slide. Jerry might have some other thoughts. But I think what we should talk about is what SDV is in open source. So there's a lot of people who are trying to write specs about open source, about SDVs. And we know all the groups. You know, it's an it's a, it's a alphabet soup of different uh, organizations. Um, but I'll tell you that AGL is the only open source project really already in position for building the software-defined vehicle of the future. So we're built and tested using open source tools. We collaborate with a large number of open source projects, including some of the alphabet soups that I, t that I mentioned. Um, we've got downloadable binaries today for Kimu and a wide variety of boards. And Jerry's group at Panasonic has demonstrated that they can run the same binary, the same executable on an ARM board, I'm not an ARM board, on a Renaissance board and a Qualcomm board and in the cloud. So we've already got some of these building blocks in place. Um, we're the only projects that we're not captive to corporate sponsors. Um, we're not interested in writing specs because I there's nobody on AGL who wants to write a spec. Everybody wants to write code. We love writing code. Um, 
And we're, we're, we're not one of those projects that have a lot of orphaned or bit rotted code that, you know, sometimes companies just take code and throw it over the wall. And, and we've seen that in, in some other organizations. So if it works, if the code works, if it satisfies a need, we'll use it. And we really believe in collaborate and share. That's the only way we're going to increase velocity, reduce, cross, reduce costs across the industry. And when there's an open source version, open source code version of a standard, everybody wins. We've seen throughout my life, so many specs that were written, starting from, let's start with the AT command spec, that were just a nice little API or interface, but nobody ever defined behavior. Nobody ever told you what was supposed to happen when you invoke that interface. Is it synchronous? Is it asynchronous? Do I, you know, what, what's supposed to happen? Um, <clears throat> so at the end of the day, the spec plus the code equals everybody wins. So I think what we, what we should talk about is what part of the software defined vehicle should AGL continue to work on in the next couple of years that gets us closer to the, the vision of delighting the customer with a high compute platform that is always connected. So I'll open it up for, I'll, I'm gonna, I'll start by opening it up to Jerry to see what his thoughts are. <laughs> and Jerry's like, what did you do to me? <laughs> vehicles so let's first maybe think about what is the software defined products I think everyone actually have some software defined products and anyone can have a guess oh <laughs> you did a, a very fast and anything else that uh, our audience would like to, to, to give an example Yes, this, right, right. And what's the common, what's the commonality of those products? Yes, that's all, right. So that is actually the software itself is defined the values of the, of the product. So that means, so SDV, okay, it is vehicle, but we can also see software defined value of the product. So this actually, you can think about, about the updatability and about also the connectivity. So th those are all uh, basically actually um, enabled by software and all, um, and you know, update of uh, software is more easy than a hardware. So that means that most of your, your, your values can be created by software continuous, uh, continuously after the, the release, and uh, this can, can, can always make your product, the, if, if my product, I, I, I buy it and uh, no software update, then maybe in one year or two years, it's out of date. But for, for now, for the, this kind of smart devices, although there will be probably some performance issues if you're using for a long time, but uh, at least uh, for, for, for iPhone or, or for your, your smartwatch, you can use the several years, right? So I think this may be one interpretation of the uh, software defined uh, vehicles and also uh, something probably uh, also introduced in my, uh, my previous uh, uh, speech yesterday. We can also interpret uh, SDV to be speedily deliver values. So that means uh, not only uh, you, you the software defined values, but uh, for, from the uh, manufacturer or say from the OEMs tier one and application vendor, what we need is to rapidly produce the values all enabled by this kind of technology. So this is my comments. All right, anybody else have any, any great thoughts? I think we've got a microphone here. Oh, there's another microphone there. Yeah, go ahead. So I think uh, if we compare it, it with uh, mobile phones and uh, cars, so 
in mobile mobile phone we mainly have software update but in sdv we might have software and hardware update updates both because compared to mobiles it's easy to update hardwares in cars i guess so well, what do people do now they don't they upgrade their hardware <laughs> they buy, i bought an iphone i had an iphone 8 and i upgraded my hardware i bought no, an it's iphone like completely upgrading from one device to another it's like in one car we can upgrade some one piece of hardware it might be an another thing that might be in, in the sdv to me, I think the, the barrier to entry that I heard, at, 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 I've heard a lot of in a lot of places, is the thought that you're going that somehow, and, and this is kind of a mindset change, I think, at the procurement departments of the OEMs, which is, I need to have upgradable hardware. So, do I build that upgradable hardware when I build the car? So, I build I build a process, I put a processor in that's oversized for what I need today and more memory in than what I need today, but that comes at a cost. Or do you, or like you said, do I upgrade the hardware by, at some point in the life cycle of the car, pull this unit out and put a new unit in? Um, I think that's a, a question that's left, that, that's kind of open, that's out there. Um, the idea of, you know, in the past, I don't, know, I don't know how much people do this anymore, but in the past, people would take their car and they would replace their radio and, and upgrade the radio. Um, which the OEMs I don't think ever really uh, approved of. <laughs> but you're, I think you're talking more about an OEM approved upgrade path where, you know, maybe you've owned the car for three years and now I can put a new compute module in there, right? Uh, the, 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 the other units. So that means so we definitely need a clear interface, a common interface, a standard interface to uh, make that hardware uh, compatible with the, any future updates and uh, the software running on the top of it. And I think this is also something um, what AGL is also doing, this kind of uh, interface definition uh, in the uh, in the <laughs> RJC, uh, our reference hardware expert group, and also like our SDV expert group. Um, on the other hand, uh, beside this kind of mode of trend, I think uh, for, 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 for iPhone, I think uh, in Japan there is a mode. I believe in US there is something similar so that you mentioned that, uh, for example, you have a continuous uh, um, license or contract, and uh, we say some, 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 I mean, you upgrade at you upgrade. periodic intervals. And every year <coughs> when they release a new product, you can exchange your old iPhones with the latest one, but you, you have a, this kind of a continuous uh, um, <laughs> program, a loyalty program, you can say. So this may be also a, 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 a mode of, of uh, uh, how OEMs can, can, can sell uh, automotives in the future. Buy a whole new car? Hmm? Buy a whole new car? <laughs> you, you, I mean, you exchange a, 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 a new a module. model. Maybe not one year, but two years. Uh, every two years, you can can, can, can provide a upgrade uh, program for, for your your your, um, your your user or customer. Maybe maybe it's it's another software defined product that we didn't mention was a PC. Mm -hmm. All right, I buy my my son wanted me to help him build a gaming PC, so we built a gaming PC, and then. A few months later, he's like, well, Dad, I need more, I uh, need a new graphics card. So what do you do? You go, you open up that whole thing, you swap out the graphics card, you swap it, you swap it a new one, but it's all, you know, based on, you know, common standards. And then, oh, now that thing's sucking too much power, so I need a new power supply. So, you know, and so is it is it that model or is it the iPhone or phone, you know, throw away the whole thing and replace it model? I, I think that's also something. But you don't throw away the software. Yeah. You don't throw away the software. And what you need actually is a, a, some, some scalable hardware. Um, I, I think in the automotive world there is a, a trend of chiplets, which actually you have a more uh, scalable 
um, I mean CPU, GPU, all this come for computing resources and also the I.O. Um, I mean dice so that you can um, customize the, 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 the uh, computing power and all this kind of uh, device uh, um, re resources um, so, so scalable to your, your own, own product. And uh, since this kind of hardware architecture is also involved, I think this is also a, another aspect of SDV that uh, uh, in the future probably it is called maybe something called software defined hardware so that is the hardware itself is uh, supporting the software. Oh, he's got another one back there. Uh, this is just my personal opinion, but um, yeah, um, I think uh, updatability is definitely the key uh, key factor of the SDV. And but just decoupling uh, software from hardware by uh, uh, virtualization or something is not sufficient, I guess. And what, what Azure should do first will be uh, define the uh, use case of the uh, update uh, in the uh, uh, big product and uh, how to guarantee that uh, uh, updatable software by design. I think. Test. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, um, for me, SDV is three key things. One is uh, consolidation of multiple software functions uh, on the same processor. And the reason for that is because there's just too many computers in a car. And there's really, I think, you know, there, there's some of them, of course, have to be separate, right? They, they do critical things, but a lot of them, instrument cluster, heads up display, you know, infotainment, easily should be all together. And so consolidation, uh, it, it, to me, is, is definitely a, a part of SDV. Number two is everything should be easily updatable, right? Today, it's just not easily updatable. And after three, four year, your software base in your car is orphaned. And that, that should never happen, right? This should be supported for the life of the car. And so easily updatable is, is number two for me. And then number three is um, the, uh, the, the software needs to support multiple generations of vehicles so that you're not throwing away the software each generation. And the analogy is very, very much like iOS and Apple, right? I mean, for people that own an iPhone, right, you, you download iOS, uh, iOS supports multiple generations. Yeah, after a certain point, there are certain features that will not be supported on maybe your six, seven-year-old hardware. That's fine, but the, the, I mean, the car should be the same way. Maybe if your car is eight, nine years old, the new features are not supported because your hardware is too old, but the software base should be the exact same software base. And you're updating the software for multiple generations and, and the car manufacturer it doesn't need to manage which generation you know, you're know you downloading it to. Um, that's, that's my opinion. Those are number one, two, and three for me. So can the, can the car manufacturer, <clears throat> or who, can the car manufacturer or somebody else monetize the post-delivery new features? So I got my car two years ago, and now the new cool thing, the new cool piece of software has come out for the model year 24 cars. Um, who should pay for me getting that? How, how, who pays for me to upgrade the software? Do I have to go pay a thousand dollars to go get these new features how's that how, what do people think about that is that something that the car manufacturers should just give away because it's not in their financial interests right so i i think the car manufacturers should you know learn from apple <laughs> because apple you know monetizes via the hardware 
and they give away the software. And it, and after a while, there's new features that you want, but you need to upgrade the actual hardware. You need to buy a new phone. So I think the same, I, pers this is my personal opinion, it should be the same for cars. The software should be free, and the new features you're getting are free, but at one point, some of the you know, whiz-bang new features require a new car. <laughs> so maybe that's a reason for buying a new car. But then, so it's, it's, it's really like the Apple model, in my opinion, and that's what car manufacturers should do. I have a different opinion because I think uh, for iPhone, it's still something affordable for me to exchange a hardware, for example, every year. But for a car, I don't think so. So probably I, 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 I before, um, I think instead of buying a new, a complete new uh, car, maybe uh, having this kind of uh, additional services in my car it will be something acceptable. Or on the other hand, maybe just uh, um, even I, I don't need to own my own, own car just uh, using the, 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 the car rent, for example. That's also good enough. And for, for car rent, you can always have the always the latest feature if OEMs can support that. Mm -hmm. um, I think you are both right, um, and I think there there can be some middle ground. So um, while the software and the features um, should be given away for free, I, in my personal opinion. Um, if the hardware does not support it anymore, I don't see the reason to exchange the car. Uh, my hardware doesn't support it anymore, but my tires are still good, my steering wheel is still good, and so on. And um, we know phones that are easily fixable, easily um, exchangeable components, and there's no real reason to exchange the whole car. We only need to exchange, let's say, I need to upgrade this and that ECU for that, and there should be a um, maintain uh, a feasible concept um, from the manufacturers to exchange only those parts if needed for new features. Um, so that would be, I think, give most benefit to the users and also to other points uh, like uh, the considerations for the environment and so on because it's not needed to exchange everything um, if you just want to run the software on new hardware. You're driving seat is still good. I think, I think in terms of what Dan said, for keeping the, um, in terms of keeping the software free, it's not really free, right? But if they're going to give away the software, it's you know one of the hard problem, one of the difficulties that the OEMs face today in doing something like that is just the sheer number of SKUs they have for head units for infotainment systems. Toyota probably has hundreds and hundreds of SKUs with different processors and different configurations for all of the IVI systems that they sell throughout the world. It's probably a I mean, having done this with Motorola and mobile phones, I mean, we would just have tons and tons of SKUs for the same phone that we were selling throughout the, wor throughout the world with different regionalizations and different configurations. And now they've got not only that problem, but they've got Panasonic selling them head units and Bosch selling them head units and Conti and Alpine and everybody else, and they're all different configurations. And I think a, a great way to move ahead and, and make that software free and easily swappable between different versions is the um, hardware agnostic features of Vert.io that we're already working on in AGL. And another thing is that uh, we, I, um, software is a very huge concept and uh, it's a, you know, um, in my yesterday presentation, the software volume of the a vehicle itself is uh, growing from, um, about uh, uh, six thousand times compared with what it is uh, in what it was in in two thousand. So that means uh, if every cost is a uh, is a uh, is a share is a, is a, is a uh, something that 
just uh, one OEM itself to to, to take all the cost and uh, give it free to the uh, customers. So no OEMs can, can, can suffer this kind of things. So that's the reason why open source is needed. At least uh, maybe, for example, 70 or 80 percent of the software, so those kind of uh, non-differentiable uh, software can be uh, really developed together across the industry so that the, those parts can be uh, not a burden to OEM steer around or whatever and can give, give it uh, free to the customers. And then for the remaining 20 or 30 percent, for example, um, that is uh, something OEMs uh, and tier runs or, or, or application vendors can have their uh, differentiated uh, area to, to, to sell it. That's my opinion. Alfred, it's about time you had something to say. I was waiting. We weren't going to end this till you had something to say. Yes, Walt. <laughs> <laughs> so, so my, my, the question I have always in mind when we're discussing about STV and next generation and so on <coughs> is uh, how do we ensure the maturity of the, of the post software deliveries? Right, because nowadays it's super easy, right? So you have... Uh, <laughs> super easy, no one's ever yeah. described. <laughs> <laughs> also, not, also not super easy, but easy, easy compared to that what will come, right? Because we have uh, ABC sample, we, we increase the maturity with the vehicle, right? We have winter tests, summer tests, and so on. So here we find a lot of bugs and, uh, and can fix it before SOP. But how, how will it be in future, right? So how it is ensured when I... Maybe I download a certain feature and, and then we get some performance issues or, or whatever can come, right? So how, who has an idea how to overcome this? Uh, this would be my, would be, would be, it's still not clear for me. Right, how do, you, how do you ensure that you don't brick the car when you add some new lovely, lovely feature, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. I just went, I, I probably told you the story, but I just went through this experience with my Hyundai where they wanted me to update my own uh, IVI system, you know, format a, a USB drive and put it in and keep the car running for an hour and a half. And my concern through the whole thing was, well, what happens if I brick the car, you know? Um, how do they know I picked the right version of the software off of their website? Because sometimes the whole system must be tested together, right? And, right. And then it, it, everything gets more complicated, right? With hypervisor, with virtualization methodologies and things like that. So how, Matti, yeah. Ma yeah. to you. <laughs> I, give, I give it to you. Yeah. And maybe one thing, this, uh, this uh, for example, the work that Virtio over cloud, yeah? Well, I don't know what was the name, that we uh, uh, test and validate everything on, on virtual environments in cloud. Yeah, all the software, we can, we can test that. Something like what, what is the running on, AGL can be tested on cloud completely, yeah? Maybe that, that, could, be a, that could be a solution, yeah. So anybody else have any thoughts? Um, I think on the hardware side, the car companies could learn from the telecom industry, which is, you know, switches, routers e are easily upgradable where you pull out a controller card, you put in a new one, which is, you know, double the power and double the performance. And, you know, and that's very common. And then when new interfaces come up, you know, when, when we went from gigabit Ethernet to 10 gig Ethernet, those interface cards were upgradable to just plug it in. The, the car industry could really learn from that by having pluggable hardware that is easily upgradable. You know, you probably still need to do it at the dealer, but easily upgradable for a modest cost, right? So you you charge the, the owner, whatever, 500 bucks, and they get a new control unit, and they get all the new features and the new, you know. And I, I don't know why we're not there, <laughs> but that's something I would say if, I, you know, if I was a car manufacturer, I'd be looking into that. And then you could even standardize that, call it the backplane, the interface, right? You could standardize it so you can have different uh, hardware vendors compete for your business for the next upgrade. 
that kind of stuff. I mean, uh, it doesn't have to be like so uh, rigid and not modifiable. <clears throat> Anybody else have anything? So just uh, one closing question and I'll ask if anybody has any ideas. What do you what would you like to see AGL accomplish in the next year with respect to software defined vehicles? I see Ishi-san Ishi is deep in thought about that. Either that or he's falling asleep. <laughs> Jerry, what would you like to see AGL accomplish? For anything in SDV, what would you like to see us have ready for the industry? Maybe the ultimate goal is uh, something that uh, we have a 70 or 80, 70 percent ready um, software for the, 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 the automotive that uh, OEMs and the tier runs so do not need to do those, I mean, redundant work. <coughs> yep. I know Mata just wants better documentation. <laughs> better documentation. Well, unless there's any other thoughts, I think we'll wrap it up. This was really good. Say that again. A software architecture that can uh, work for a long time and can be upgradable for a long time. Yep. And also, um, from my perspective, I, I hope, <laughs> maybe it's not a, a, a software or this uh, kind of thing, but uh, from the AGL perspective, we, we should have more young man. Although from personally, we, 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 we have already uh, put a lot of uh, young engineers into the committee activities, but uh, especially for this SDV and those kind of things, um, Especially these future things, we, we need more diverse voice, not mm -hmm. uh, limited to the uh, one generation, but uh, for different generations. So I, I, I would say in, in a couple of years, my wish, wish would be that uh, AGL is the number one when we are talking about open source and STV, right? Benchmark. This, this should be. This should be the goal because I can imagine in the next couple of years there will be many initiatives coming up because open source, everybody talks about open source and STV, right? Mm -hmm. And here I think if, uh, if AGL is the benchmark and is really ahead of the others, this would be, this would be my wish. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Yeah. I don't know if it is good or not. So Formula One cars has so many sensors and technologies and many things. So maybe we can learn many new things from them and we can make some of them as a like uh, normal for the day to day life, mm -hmm. like regular cars. So few things can be um, chosen from Formula 1 cars for the normal cars, I guess. Because they have so many sensors and technologies and they use softwares a lot. So, I think so.
All right, one last chance if you have a comment, question. <clears throat> this has been really great. Thank you, everybody. And uh, we have one last session left. Hope you enjoy it. Michelle's here for, to, to tell us about Vert.io some more. And uh, otherwise, I hope you enjoyed Automotive Linux Summit. Thank you.